Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Photography Academy's Top Talk guest webinar tonight with Matthew Maddock. Matthew, I know I have you uh, waiting in the wings there, so uh, good evening to you and thank you for joining us. Good evening, Jay. Nice to meet you. Uh, Matthew, before we get started, just give little people a short sort of introduction into you uh, and your photography and where you got to today, and then we'll have a little quick chat about your website so now they can find out a little bit more about you before I hand the screen over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm Matthew Maddock, as you know. I'm in my late 30s. Uh, photography has always been a, a big part of my life, but I never really did it commercially until until quite late on. I only really picked up a camera really four years ago to start working in it. Um, I try and specialise in industrial hospitality and outdoor sports, uh, and I shoot with now with the Fujifilm X series cameras. Ah, oh, brilliant, mate! And obviously they can see you on the screen at the moment, and they can hear you. Um, I just want to to people to be aware of how they can find out a little bit more about you. I've got two links that are live on the screen. I'll be posting all of these links yeah. out to uh, the audience throughout the night. But uh, firstly, let's just uh, take a quick look at um, uh, your website there. Hopefully, it's going to redirect me. So this is um, where they find your website, Matthew. And it's, 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 not, it's not mmaddock.co.uk. It's memaddock.co.uk, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Uh, so this is where you can see uh, Matthew's work and find out a little bit more about him. And the other thing that we wanted, you wanted us to, to tell people about tonight was your, was your blog site, Matthew. Tell them a little bit about Photomad while I, uh, I show them that. Yeah, Photomad is, um, was kind of my journey from DSLR to, to mirrorless systems. So I, I had a, a big DSLR and I wanted something small to carry around and I didn't really know what to get and at that time when I started this there wasn't a lot of information on, on mirrorless systems so it kind of started really as my journey into you know reviews and information on, on mirrorless cameras and then as time went on I, I started using the Fuji systems and then I became exclusively Fuji and I now dedicated this Photomad site to Fujifilm X series really. And that's so that's photomad with double D at the end dot com, isn't it? Double D, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. I can see you nice and clear here, mate. I'm going to go silent, and as I said, I'll interject with questions, or if there are any problems with the playback, I'll let you know as soon as any of there is. All the best, mate. Thanks, man. Thank you. Right. Evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining me. I'm not, I'm not going to bore you straight away with my whole photographic life story. I'm kind of going to jump into my commercial work and then I'll go back over my history in photography and, and the gear I use when I get to my personal work. Now, in terms of being a professional, I would really class myself as being a part-time professional in that I wouldn't say I earn enough money from just purely taking photographs. But that's actually a choice for me. I'd rather have the freedom to shoot the stuff that interests me and rather than having to shoot stuff to pay the bills, uh, photography is very much a passion for me and I, I don't want to take that away. It, it's a very hard job to make a living simply from taking photographs for clients and the majority of photographers I know, even some well-known ones, have other jobs either within the industry or, or elsewhere just to supplement their photography. Now if you're starting out, I certainly wouldn't recommend just quitting the day job and going straight for it just supplement your job with, with some photography and see how things go. So I'll get on to how I got into commercial photography. It, it was an area that I knew I wanted to work in, one I knew I could make some money from, so I started shooting personal projects to that aim. And unless you're really lucky, you're not going to get a job in commercial photography without somebody being able to see some images that you've produced previously. Now, there are several ways you can get into it, but this is the way I did it. Now, environmental portraits are of particular interest for me, and at the time I was living in France, I asked my local baker if I could spend the day with him, and he was fantastic. He allowed me to come in for the whole day, just work around him, shooting him, and he even got me involved in making some of the bread, which was brilliant. And it was probably, at the time, the most difficult conditions you could have put me in, with small cramped areas, there was lighting from windows, the oven, about three different types of artificial lights in there, which made the images look completely different from one part of the bakery to the other. I've just got a, a few images here. Now you can see in this last one, this has a different look to it than the others because there was a big strip light over the top, 
and it's something I've learnt now, I'll go back and correct for. But I absolutely loved this day. I hadn't been paid for it, but I gained a lot of experience from just a one day, and I'd come away with a small portfolio of images I could use. For the next year or so, I was then shooting everything I could to build up a portfolio of images I could show off to commercial clients. It's not something that just happened overnight. And as it happened in my day job, I had a meeting with someone who ran their own marketing company. And I thought marketing, photography, it kind of goes together. And I knew it w would be an opportunity to show off my photography. So I, I literally filled the walls of my offices with, with my prints. And it worked. Partway through the meeting, she actually mentioned the photographs. And I said they were mine. And she said, well, I've got this job coming up with a manufacturing company. And I need a photographer to shoot images for a marketing campaign. So I went onto the computer and actually showed her these shots from the bakery as it was a sort of industrial style that had done and she loved them and we pretty much agreed terms there and then. So you've really got to recognize opportunities and just grab them when you can. Now the remit of this job was to shoot products the company produced which were molds for creating products from molten plastic beads, boxes, wheelie bins, that sort of thing. So I had a good look at their existing images and what they did and had this idea to shoot from inside the moulds to get some different type of shots for them. I hired the widest angle lens I could and this was the result of that. Now, if I hadn't done my research on this, I would never have got this shot. It worked out better than I expected because when they put the plastic beads in, this static in, in the mould actually created this fantastic effect and just having the equipment, because I'd thought about it beforehand, I was actually able to get this shot, which I've never seen anywhere else. This is a technical side. Shooting this, I had, it was a D800 with a 12mm Sigma lens, and there was a speed light just tucked in the entrance to this mold to shoot it. Now this, this was a fantastic place. There was flames everywhere, and who can resist frame, fr flames? <laughs> You're always going to get a dramatic image with flames, and this place was, was just a paradise for that. But you'll notice as we go along that I like to do a lot of these detailed shots, but I also like the human element. And I wasn't really asked to shoot portraits for this, but I couldn't help but shoot them when I got a chance with my second camera, which was the X-Pro. And these are a few of those shots. I just kind of grabbed these when I could. These portraits, as it turned out, were the ones they actually used the most of all of them, even though they didn't ask them. I'm not saying you should ignore what the customer asks you to do, shoot what they want, but, but don't be afraid to add your own ideas and your character into the shoot because it will make you stand out. Something else to be aware of is I had um, a shoot for a photo booth company, the photo booth franchise. They didn't really know what they wanted. They needed some marketing and promotional material. And when I turned up, they had organized a room full of people, but they didn't really have a good idea of what they wanted to shoot or any particular structure to the day. So I'd done a bit of research and looked into what I thought I was going to do and I knew that they would want pictures of people as though they were in a photo booth, but I couldn't get into the photo booth with them. So I took with me a huge softbox to get the sort of shadowless photo booth look and a, a pop-up background and created a mini studio. And we had some, some good fun with that, especially the children who really got into it. But making a photo booth look kind of cool isn't very easy, and especially when you've got no direction nobody's giving you any idea of what they want to do so I had to develop ideas as I went along and this was towards the end of the day I thought about what would happen on a wedding day and perhaps a bride and groom would go in in the evening so I got them to close all the curtains make the room dark and I put my speed light in the photo booth and made it look like the photo booth was taking a shot of this this couple and I think this this one worked quite well. So 
be prepared not to just turn up to a shoot, but also sometimes to have to direct it a bit and and take over if you have to. And and part of that, what helped me here was doing some research beforehand, and it's very important to to do your research before you turn up to a job. So I, I was picking up jobs here and there, but I, I kind of wanted to shoot a bit more regularly, especially paid work. And I began to think about what area I could get into shooting more. And I happen to live in one of the biggest tourist destinations in the UK, the Lake District. And the hospitality industry seemed fairly obvious. There's, there's hotels all around here, restaurants everywhere. But I had no experience of doing this. So I spent a long time online reading, watching videos, getting ideas of learning how to shoot interiors. I shot my own house many times just practicing. Then I asked around a couple of the hotels and this newly opened restaurant who they just allowed me to wander around with my camera gear, which was fantastic. I gave them the pictures in exchange, but to be honest, they didn't really need them. They were just doing me a favor. Um, I was very, very fortunate that way. Well, like the bakery job, I came away from this with just a small portfolio and, and experience of doing it, which is, is, is as important. My problem is I, I know my weaknesses well and I'm not a salesperson. I, I'm a little shy. I can't really get out. I'm not into getting out there and just phoning somebody up and saying, have you got work for me? So what I actually did was I found um, a specialist in a telesales and direct sales who who then hammered the local hotels and restaurants for me and picked up work for me. While she was out, before she did that, I set up a website that was just based around hospitality. That it, it kind of made it look like that was what I did most of. I know that's a, a bit cheeky, but it's it's really all about presentation. If you've got a general website showing showing hundreds of different genres and styles and photographs, you just going to confuse any clients, make them think you're not really the expert that they need for that job. When you start out, it's, it's quite hard to have quite a narrow focus because you, te you tend not to have a lot of images of the same sort of thing. And, and it's, it's actually a mistake I made in the early days. I was literally out there posting any image I thought was half decent to the web. Not only does does it make people think you're not focused, but when you look back later, you wonder why you even thought those images were any good. And uh, you may or may not notice, but stuff on the internet has a habit of hanging around and haunting you later on. So be careful with what images you post, and and I would suggest less is less is better. Just pick the very best ones, even if it's just one shot out of a shoot. It, it's enough to get people's interest. So these are a small selection of images from my first paid job in the hospitality industry. It was a beautiful hotel. All they wanted me to do was shoot one room and some exterior shots. And it, it was a perfect first job. I had a half a day to shoot the room and then a little bit of time after to shoot the outside. So it, it gave me the time just to relax into it and and get those images. All my interior shots are, are lit with, with speed lights or I used Elinchrome quadras um, just to let me use the lowest ISO value I can. But I do try to light things to look as natural as possible so hopefully you can't tell too much here that the room's actually lit and it looks natural. And most hotels only really need three or four shots for a room so I tend to, to shoot one of the bed one of perhaps a wider view of the room, and then just a couple of detail shots. You'll, you'll notice this as I go through, I like to use mirrors. And uh, here I have a bit of detail, but you can also see some of the room. But be careful shooting any room with a mirror in it, because you can completely ruin a shot with a poorly composed reflection that you may not notice until you get home. And when it came to the exterior, I wanted it to have a sort of homely, warm feel. So I found these loungers outside uh, to make it welcoming. And there's, there's a few other exterior shots, but I'm not going to go through all of them. 
as you sort of gain more experience, you start to recognize the sort of shots that work well. So this sort of across the bed shot is one of my favorites. And it's, I like the idea that, that the hotel's client can imagine being in that bed and what they'll see. Again, my, my passion for detail, and I try to pick out some of these details like this, and you'll see a few of these. Um, these work quite well on the web and in brochures and things for people. But one problem you come across in this is what do you do when the room doesn't look very pretty? So what I tend to do is get a bit creative, fall back on my love of detail, pick out a few details, but I've also in the background there you can see the room and the lamps on so the room looks nice and warm and you can see the bed, but you can't really see this very patterned cover that's on the bed and is totally distracting. Again here this room was very fussy. Um, so what I've done is I arranged the these things here in the mirror and then shot into the mirror so you could see a reflection of the room so you get an idea of what the room looks like but not necessarily that it's it's really quite fussy and not the best of rooms. Now bathrooms is one part that I hate doing and this is an absolute prime example it's certainly not the worst I've shot but it, it's not pretty and in that sort of case I tend to just again I try and pick a detail out of the room you can get some nice looking bathrooms, but they're quite small, so I try to shoot this one. I try to pick out the details in the room, and again, I use the mirror there just to pick out the fact that there's a nice old-fashioned shower so people can see kind of the whole idea of the bathroom, but not necessarily that, it, that it's particularly small here. You can get in some pretty weird positions as well shooting baths here. I was actually laying down in the bath. Um, the bathrooms, uh, you can get into trouble in bathrooms because there's a lot of shiny things, a lot of mirrors, and if you're not careful you find your reflection in absolutely everything. So one thing, if you want to do this, I would say wear white clothes or light clothes, you can actually just see my reflection in there if you look carefully. Uh, another thing you can do is actually just lay a towel over yourself. Now, something that's quite important when you're shooting commercial photography is to think about how your clients will use the images. I try to get a few here where you could place copy on the image. So the top left of this and across the top you see I've left it fairly natural, fairly neutral so that the client could put text over this if they wanted to in a brochure. And similarly in things like this at the bottom they could put text in there and, and the same again here they could put text down to the to the left there. And something I want to move on to now is really post-production. Uh, when I started out doing this, I found myself quite frustrated when I was learning that none of my images really matched what I was seeing other people producing, or at least not the people I was aspiring to be anyway. Now you've seen this this image before. But what you didn't see is actually the image that I shot. And there's, there's a fair bit of post-processing going on with this image. I try and keep it subtle so that you can't really notice it. But if we look at the, the image that I shot, there's quite a difference there. Now that's, that's an okay image, but it's nothing special. If you go back to the one I presented to the client, you can see there's, it, it suddenly jumps out at you and it looks a lot more inviting and welcoming. When I shoot, I actually shoot with post-production in mind. I know from my cameras I can pull more detail from the shadows than I can from the highlights, so I always shoot slightly underexposed, as you can see here, just to preserve those highlights. Now that's often against what you're told to do, which is exposed to the right, but it's what works for my cameras and it's, it's what you've got to learn by practicing what works for your cameras and what you can do with them. I use a, a variety of techniques for post-production, all of which happily I can now do in Lightroom since Lightroom 5 came out. I, I try and avoid Photoshop as much as I can because I just find it way over complicated. Now, with this image you can see the, there's a blue color cast coming from the window when you shoot mixed lighting 
you can't always get everything bang on. The camera will only guess at the correct white balance and choose the one that shoots the majority of the frame. So the first thing I did was I I used a brush on that, that window area to take out the blue cast on there and then I pulled some of the detail out of the shadows and then enhanced various areas with in Lightroom 5 you can now use the radial filter and it kind of makes parts of the image look as though they're lit when they're actually not. So if we look at these you can see if you look backwards and forwards the pillows have highlights on them that don't actually exist and <laughs> somebody wouldn't know if they weren't in the room but there could be a light above on the ceiling that is highlighting that and it just adds a little extra interest and something extra to the picture that's not there normally and it just makes it jump out at you better. For this sort of thing, I, depending on how complicated it is, I can spend between 10 and 30 minutes on an individual image and you get quicker as you go along. Some need more, some need less. I have a couple of other examples of this. This is the exterior shot I showed you before. Now, this is the image as I shot it and that's the image I presented to the client. Why, why give a client a, a substandard image? when you can present something that's <laughs> that's more appealing to their clients. And what the, the, the owner of this hotel actually said to me, I don't remember the sky being blue when you shot this, and actually it wasn't blue. I almost painted it in blue to make it look better. This was an early morning shot, and the sun was, I was trying to catch the sort of golden hour, as it were, um, to make it look appealing, and the sun didn't quite come up, and it was a bit of a misty day sun was just catching the top of these loungers, but I actually added some almost fake sun rays into the grass in the bottom there to make it look a bit more appealing to people. Another one here is this is a jetty from a hotel and they wanted me to shoot this. I sort of scoped it out the day before and I went down at five o'clock in the morning to get the morning sunrise shot off it, but it just didn't work out because it was a misty day and the sun just wasn't shining as I liked it for. There wasn't the budget in the job to let me go every single day until I got the perfect shot. So I shot it for this thinking what I would do afterwards and that's the shot that I then presented. This here <coughs> is, is another shot that's had quite a bit of post-production. This was just a personal shot that I, that I posted up online it was then, this was seen by an agency and I subsequently licensed it to an Australian company who've used it in their promotional campaign for a brand of lamb. And something I'd, I'd just like to touch on here is that is you don't need high-end, high-megapixel cameras to shoot commercially. This was shot on the X-Pro1 with a 14 millimeter lens that's 16 megapixels, but this is actually a crop from that, so it's even smaller than that. And aside from the packaging, they've put this on large posters. And believe it or not, they've even, this goes on the side of their HGV lorry fleet. So it goes across the whole side of a lorry. And people telling you you need 20, 30 megapixels minimum to print, to print posters. It's, in the real world, it's not, not necessary. So don't think you need a D800 or medium format camera to, sh to shoot for big big pictures because you, you just don't. There are some clients, perhaps in the future when you become you know, the, the best in your field that will then require you to have the absolute best image quality, but don't go out spending a fortune on gear that you just don't need to start with. I'm going to kind of finish off talking about my commercial work now with what I have planned for the future. As I said, my passions are really environmental photography and the outdoors. And I'm trying to combine the two here and shoot a series of outdoor sports within the Lake District with then a view to approaching companies selling outdoor sports gear and, and magazines in that industry. Again, I'm approaching this by just taking unpaid personal projects 
just to gain the experience and, and get a portfolio of images that I can show off. The first um, one I did was this runner here. We spent the afternoon shooting on the fells around here. These were shot with the that was shot with the X Pro One and uh, Ellen Chrome Quadra. This one here was shot with the X100S and again the Ellen Chrome Quadra. Now, well, the great thing about the X100S is that it has a leaf shutter in it, like the the Hasselblad medium format cameras, and you can sync up to a thousandth of a second with flash. So we could kill the ambient light on this and just focus on her running. Another series I've done are these um, golfing shots. This is a local golf club, which, as you'll see in a minute, overlooks the lakes. Now these were shot with a pair of speed lights. I try, I do try to keep things as natural as possible, so hopefully you can't tell too much that it's been lit. Just a, a couple more there. And in both of these, I, I did, I've done them as personal projects, and I've had the good, good will of the person involved who gave up their time just in exchange for some images of, of themselves. Now, kind of leading on from that, the company that I'd done some work for previously saw some of these shots and asked if I, I wouldn't mind shooting a sailing regatta they were sponsoring on Windermere, that I also shot their evening award presentation for them too. but. The sailing was just a, a fantastic opportunity to, to expand my outdoor sports portfolio and probably one I wouldn't have normally been able to do. These shots were taken with either the Fuji X-M1, which is the small, almost amateur level X-series camera, and the 16-50mm lens, or the X-Pro1 with the 55-200. I couldn't really change lenses while I was on the boat so that those two kind of gave me the range that I needed it was it was quite a fun day but a bit of a challenge to to drive the boat and and shoot and keep out of everybody's way at the same time it, it wasn't the windiest of days so I didn't get a huge amount of action out of this unfortunately As always, I like to get some detail shots as well, so I've just picked out a few of the people that were sailing on here. And these were shot with the X Pro One and the 55 to 200, which a lot of people would say, well, you can't shoot action sports with a, a Fujifilm camera; it's not for that. But you just kind of you learn to work with it. It's not perfect. Perhaps I would have been able to pick out. A few more shots had I had a D4S and a, and a big professional lens, but I, I just worked with what I had, and I don't think I don't think I really missed out on anything particularly. So that's that's kind of where I am with my commercial work now. I have a, a shoot planned with a couple of mountain bikers, and then I'll start getting my images around and start trying to pick up some paid work in this field. Before I finish off with the, with the commercial side, I just one last piece of advice, and probably the most important one is when you're shooting commercially, get a contract. Just if you can pay for a solicitor to write for you one, do that. If you can't, there's online templates. In the worst case, just write something really simple yourself. You, you would really be amazed how easy it is to get into a dispute with people over the silliest of things. I had one, one hotel owner complain that my images were out of focus, and, and they weren't, of course, but when I looked through them, I realized that I'd used a shallow depth of field to pick out some details, and then they refused to pay for the images because they said, well, they're out of focus. So you need to, to protect yourself from things like that. Make sure you know your client knows what to expect from you, what you expect from the client, what is and isn't included, Importantly, make sure they know what licensing rights they're buying. Tell them that you're retaining copyright unless they're prepared to pay a fortune. Tell them all, <laughs> what that means. And I always say that I will use some of these images for promotional purposes so I can then use them on my website to get other jobs. But you do have to be careful there because well, I've come across it and you might come across situations where images are commercially sensitive. 
and, and you need to be sure that you don't ac accidentally release some sensitive information by putting images on your website, so you do need to check that with them first. Okay, so on to some of my personal work here. Matthew, would you like me to interject there and just ask you a few of the questions that I've been coming through about the commercial now rather than hang on to them to later? Or? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. I've stopped, I haven't stopped talking yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, to be honest, um, as the question, you answer a lot of the questions, which you did say you were planning to do uh, in your presentation. So, um, uh, But I think it's a good time before we move on just to get a few of the commercial sort of stuff out of the way, because okay. I know we're going to be looking at uh, some of the other uh, of your, uh, your other photography and your other loves as well. Um, so I'm going to just run through what I have. Um, so there's not a particular order, I'm sorry about that, I, I tried to get them in an order for you. Um, so okay. going back to the hotel rooms and so on, um, do you set these up or are they set up to a standard and then you fine tune um, the location itself? Uh, it depends on the hotel to be honest. Um, some of them like to have somebody who will set them up. Um, a lot of them I will set up and I'll move a lot of things around in the room so I try to get all the clutter out of the way I move remote controls I move bins I move the the tray of um, you know coffee and tea around the room into somewhere a bit more appropriate or sometimes completely out of the way so it really depends job by job brilliant okay but and um, actually you did mention actually it came in the in the discussion there about your contract and somebody refusing uh, because of focus. Um, you and I discussed this before before the webinar, but um, uh, one of the questions we were asked is do you have a pref you know preferred settings or your choice of depth of field? Uh, I know you have an answer for that, so I thought we'd address it now really uh, before that, rather than later. Um, I shoot what, what's relevant for, the, for, for what I'm doing. Um, what I say to people is look at my site, look at my images, this is what I do. So if you don't like this style, I'm not the photographer for you. Does that make sense? No, it does indeed, yeah, absolutely. Um, so so going back, so you mentioned, that, obviously I mentioned that that was relevant to a question you had about contract. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of key things there. I suppose, like you said, though, it is important. Somebody's asked, you know, what should be in the contract? Well, make it very clear what the customer is getting, isn't it? I suppose if you can't afford to, to, to uh, approach a solicitor at this stage. Yeah, very much so. Just, just make it clear what they are getting, sort of. I even put approximately how many images that they're expected to receive, that are how much editing that you may or may not do on them, and whether that's included, and and the licensing rights they're getting. I've got a couple of shots there about um, the the sport. Uh, everything. Oh, actually, I'm going to digress. Sorry, I'm going to jump jump ship on that question in a second. Uh, you mentioned that you you post process uh, everything in in Lightroom. That's your preferred choice, isn't it? If somebody's asked specifically about you, you know what you're using. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, it is very much so. Right, brilliant. Um, the sale, the sailing photographs. Um, mm. What type of client would that particular typically be for? Um, this was a company who sold. Um, clothing for the sailing industry but some of those images also went to Beneteau which was it was Beneteau uh, Regatta who were the, the company who made the yachts and it was it was Regatta just for them so it's you know it's within the sailing industry but not necessarily boats this as I said this was a, a company that made sailing sailing clothing Brilliant. But I suppose obviously there's boat, you know, they could be equally looking at the boating companies, couldn't they? Um, yeah, very much so. And even magazines that are in that, you know, in that industry. Um, I'm going to ask these now. I know we've touched on them earlier, so you, you, you've been, um, so a lot of questions we had through in advance. Um, finding clients, I know you touched on that. It's going out there and finding them, isn't it? And like you said, you employed a marketing agency. But how do people get started? What's the best advice you can give them to get started in the commercial photography? Um, get some images first so you've got something to show off um, and like you say it's legwork get yourself around there get writing to people sending off emails sending samples of your images just finding people who, who you think might be your clients and try and matching up with that so it's a lot of hard work and as I said I'm not a salesperson so especially with the hotels and things I'm not somebody who could just randomly phone someone up or just turn up and say give me a job 
So, you know, I found a specialist who could do that for me, and that really paid off. I mean, it, it took quite a, a healthy commission, but as I viewed it, I wouldn't have had that that job to start with if they hadn't found it for me. Brilliant. And can you just give uh, last last of the commercial questions? Um, can you give them an idea on the best way to price a commercial job? Is it uh, per day? Is it by time? What 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 they should have? I'm not you know and and the best way to sort of get an idea of what they think they should be charging. Um, I charge per half day or day. So uh, half day is a minimum. Some of the jobs I can easily do in half a day, and I find I don't feel it's really fair to charge a whole day if I can. I can be there for an hour or two hours. Um, in terms of pricing, it's something I always really struggled with. It's difficult when you get when you get started because you don't want to price yourself out of the market, but you know you need to make money out of it. So, you know, look at what other people in trades do. Do the plumbers and electricians have problem pricing themselves? You know what I mean. You know, understand what I mean. Look at hourly rates for that sort of thing, and kind of judge it from there. And what you think your your service is worth. You don't want to be losing money. But again, at the start, you don't want to be pricing yourself out of it. So I think it, yeah, it's, we, it's we, always you, a difficult one. I think you agreed with me as earlier as well when we were discussing uh, pr prior that you do have to value yourself as well, though, don't you? It's easy to undervalue what you think you're worth, isn't it? It is very easy to undervalue. Uh, yourself, yes, it, it really is, and perhaps some of my early jobs I did do that, and if I look back and actually do the figures, I probably lost money on it, and I learnt lessons from that. So uh, you've got to, if you want to, to do it commercially, you've got to make sure you make your money out of it, look at your costs, and, and just kind of go from there, really. Uh, for ourselves, just speaking quickly, as a photography academy, and obviously we're, you know, uh, with ourselves having a, a successful uh, photography business, and some of which is a commercial element as well, you know, we will look at our competition, we will look at the other photographers in the area, we will compare ourselves to them, and you do have to do that, you know, there isn't a fixed price that Matthew can share with you today, you do have to sort of value your time, work out what you charge, and, and work your way up, and as the clients come in, I'm sure Matthew will agree um, that uh, you get a bigger audience, and you'll be, they'll come to you and then you'll be able to look at it's like anything in photography with ourselves as portrait photographers you know we build up our price list and every year we look to hopefully increase it and I'm sure that's the same with you Matthew yeah very much so yes Brilliant. I'm it's, gonna... it's hard to find prices though because you know a lot of photographers are very guarded about about what they charge so it, you know it is a valid question and it is something that I think a lot of people struggle with when they set out but def definitely build up the portfolio, and I think you covered that yeah. brilliantly. I mean, you answered all of those questions straight off the bat, where you went off and you found the work and you created the work, and then you got it out there. I'm, I'm going to shut up, but that's what I have on the commercial for now. Um, and mm. uh, if you, you you move on, and then I've got some more questions for you at the end, mate. Okay. So this is a sort of some of my personal work. I feel shooting personal work is really important to your photography. It allows you to have a bit of fun with it. It allows you to sort of try out new things without worrying about mistakes. You know, if it goes wrong, it doesn't matter, does it? You're under no pressure to get something done within a certain time scale, and you can just spend the time honing your skills and, and being creative if that's what you want to do. And, and as importantly as anything else, it gets you to know your camera get to know your camera intimately because when you come to those paid jobs you don't want to be spending time fiddling about with your camera worrying about what you're doing. So I go a bit over my history really. Photography has always been been quite a big part of my life from a young age and I had a, a very cheap Zenit DSLR which I had DSLR not an SLR at the time and I used to develop and print my own work in, in the film days but then kind of real work and, and life got in the way and I, I didn't really have time to, to pursue it anymore for a long time. And I only actually really picked up a camera as I said at the start about four years ago and I kind of have to admit at this point to being a sort of typical prosumer DSLR user with ideas of grandeur and had a big camera and a big battery grip and a selection of pro lenses and I I felt the part, I looked the part, but kind of looking back now, my photography skills were, were far from amazing at that point. You know, I had however many frames a second burst mode, which is on my camera, and, you know, why take 
one image when you can take 50 you know it's it's digital now it doesn't really matter and I mean you never know what you might miss you might as well just keep keep that finger on the shutter button so I kind of had a hard drive full of 95% rubbish and the other 5% wasn't really getting any better and I I spent a day walking around Paris with a a heavy backpack full of pro DSLR gear and at the end of the day my back was killing me and I thought that you know there must be a better way than this so I started looking at, at smaller solutions like I didn't want to give up my DSLR at this point but I was looking for like a companion I could just take away on day trips and things and to cut a long story short I went through Panasonic and Olympus Micro Four Third Systems and then I, I went to the Sony Nex and then I went back to Olympus again and then I, I picked up a, a Fujifilm X100. Kind of while this was going on, I, I created the, the Photomad website, which, as I said, was an online blog about my search for this companion camera to the Nikon. The mirrorless was starting to become more popular, but it hadn't really gained a large following. And that this was my story of how I got into that. And really, my personal work has been quite eclectic. I like to shoot just family stuff and travel and a bit of landscape and just random projects like like the one that's on the screen now. It's just a bit of fun. These I think all the rest of the shots here are shot with the, the Fuji film system. I when I picked up the X one hundred I I loved this and hated this camera in equal measures. The Im image quality coming out of it absolutely blew me away but it was just such an awkward thing to use that after a month I actually sent it back out of frustration but and a few months later I was I was missing it again there was just something about it that I wasn't getting from my Nikon DSLR the price had, had dropped by then and I, I went and bought another one and this time I, I stuck with it and worked with it and I'm, I'm so glad I did because that fiddly annoying frustrating but at the same time, amazing camera really made me a better photographer. So it, it forced me to think about what I was doing before I took the shot, basically, because I, I knew I'd only get one chance with this camera, because then for the next couple of seconds, it would try to be figuring itself out before you took the next shot. So I really learned to, to look first before I shot, wait for that moment, and then get one shot instead of a burst of, of 20 or so and just hope that I pick one out of that 20 and I now I now use the X series cameras exclusively both for my personal and my commercial work and I find for personal work that they're brilliant and for commercial work that they're equally good enough to do that so what I love about these is that it's taking them out for families they just don't get in the way somehow when you take a, a DSLR out it always seems to get in the way not just physically but it kind of you almost feel like you have to shoot everything because you've got carrying this big camera and you should be shooting with it whereas with the X100 you kind of don't really notice it but when you notice a moment you just kind of grab the camera and then you can shoot it and for for travel photography, I love traveling. I'm not necessarily a travel photographer, but I do do it when I'm out and about. It's just revolutionized my life. I mean, you know, no more carrying a whole backpack around. I can carry a couple of cameras and a lens in one really small bag. And, and this has really in, in, very much improved my photography. And uh, when the X-Pro1 came out, I just I had to have that camera and I, I basically sold off all my other gear and bought that camera with the three lenses that were out with it and it's kind of this about this time that I then dedicated the Photomad website to the Fujifilm X series partly because I was just absolutely loving shooting with them but also because I, I couldn't afford to buy all the mirrorless cameras and lenses and everything out there that, to, to review for the site I, I, I want to point out now that I do have a great relationship with Fujifilm UK and some of the other subsidiaries around the world and they've been very supportive but I'm not paid or sponsored or anything like that to say anything good about them and from time to time they do 
send me a camera or a lens just to try it and review for the site, which is, is very kind of them and, and saves me a lot of money. Let's move on to the sort of travel photography side of it now. I, I try to look for, as, a, as I said before, I try to look for details, but at the same time kind of make it obvious where, where it's shot in the world so you can you get an idea of where you are instead of just a random shot. Now there's, there's literally hundreds of thousands of shots of every tourist site there is everywhere in the world and I, I don't see the point really of just adding to that pile of them. So I, I wouldn't really call myself a, a travel photographer as such but I do monetize my travel photography by putting some of these images onto the stock photography website so I have them on Alamy and I have some on Getty as well and I find something like this which is perhaps a little bit more artistic than technical tends to tends to do better than than your average shot of a monument that you may think people would want a lot of but you, you probably get pennies for it whereas something like this would be licensed for for uh, um, for a more artistic use, should we say, which, which gets more money. So I've just got a few shots here that I'll run through quickly of my, my travel photography around the world. Hopefully you can tell where this is without me telling you where it is. That, that's fairly obvious. Uh, this wall was amazing and it really is that blue, I haven't fiddled with this, it was in a town in the north of Morocco and it had been painted over so many times there must have been an inch of paint on there and this hole just showed through all the layers of the history and I, just, I had to pick that out and shoot it. And then I, this is just a, a difficult shot to get because about half a second after that he was jumping up asking for money. And I kind of went through a phase of, of shooting arches. I sort of set myself things to do, little tasks, and it, I use it to sort of develop an awareness of things around me and just getting, getting me to look out for certain things to shoot. So wherever I went, I'd be looking for arches to shoot. And then after a while you kind of start to see them in different places. I mean this is an arch but it's it's not an arch and it's something you start to notice when you do things like that and it just it does help sort of guide your eye to things and improve your skills just doing stuff like that. And now move on to some of my, my landscape work. Again I, I'm not a landscape photographer commercially um, living where I do in the lakes, you kind of you can't but help shoot landscapes here. It's it's such an amazing area. It's very easy to produce this kind of what I call fluffy cloud, pretty green landscapes. But you see these everywhere in all the shops, in all the brochures, and I don't I don't really want to do that. <laughs> it's, I want to try and do something a bit different. Having said that, this image has actually been published twice. <laughs> so sometimes it, it does help to, to, to have the odd fluffy cloud image. Um, and I kind of want to go back to a point I made earlier on this image. This was shot with the, the XM1 which is kind of the cheap amateur grade X series camera and it was shot with the very cheap one to a better word. Um, 16 to 50 millimeter kit, 16 to 50 mil kit lens that comes with that. But nobody that has used this image asked me what camera did you use they didn't care it wasn't taken with a 36 megapixel d800 and I didn't use a professional lens they liked the image and that at the end of the day is what's important when I, when I first started out I used to kind of think that ultimate image quality was the be all and end all of getting paid work in photography and I, I bought myself a d800 with that in mind but the, the more I shoot, the more I sell, the, the more I realize it's, it's really not as important as you think it, it would be. And it's certainly not as important as the forums would have you believe. I, I now have given up, as I said, given up my DSLR gear. 
I shoot exclusively with the Fujifilm X series and I've never had any client question my choice of camera, sensor size, lack of megapixels. Uh, the only comment I've had is, are you actually shooting digital? Which I, I thought was rather funny because obviously the, the Fujifilm cameras do look a little bit uh, retro, I should say. So let's go back onto the landscapes again. I, um, I've been trying to focus my personal work a bit more and I, I'm setting myself little projects to do. So this is, this is one of those. It's, um, it's a series of Windermere and they're all shot in the same 30 second exposure. They're all shot with the, the water line cutting the image in two. They've all got the same processing applied. So that I, have, I have quite a number of these but I'll just show you three of them here. So as you can see it kind of it's a, it makes a little series, it makes it look like you were doing something purposefully rather than just randomly taking different images and when people look at it they see perhaps more professionalism in it. And this one, okay it's not a long exposure but it was done at the same time as, as this personal project. I actually did shoot this in long exposure but because the masts were moving on the boats it didn't really work. So. I shot this as it was and this has also been picked up when I've licensed this image as well so sometimes shooting personal projects can become profitable as well. Another project I've started is um, going out with one camera and one lens and sometimes not the lens that you would necessarily choose to do that or to, to go out and shoot with. So I went out here with the the X-T1 and the Zeiss 50mm lens which is 75mm on the, on the APS-C. That's not what you would think of as a, a landscape lens but I kind of wanted to challenge myself to get some landscape shots with that. Uh, I'm tending towards mono nowadays for my personal work. I'm, I'm finding I, I'm enjoying shooting in mono. So there's a, a small series here. Excuse me. I'll just run through these briefly. Again, they're all, all processed similarly and, and they're all cropped in the same way, in this in this case square, and it kind of it gives it a coherence to the series. Some of the little projects I do, I, they'll run for a day. I, these ones I, I went out and shot in a day and some of them I'll I'll run alongside others sometimes for months until I feel I've, I've exhausted them. The following is a sort of a little bit abstract images that I've been shooting over several different trips when I see the right thing. Again, they're all shot with the same lens and the same processing, making a little sort of mini series. I don't actually know what the result of this series will be yet, but I could kind of see them becoming some sort of wall art or something like that. Now this one's my favourite. This cheeky little fella sat just long enough to allow me to compose and focus on him and get that shot. And finally, I'll leave you with a, a small set of images that I just shot this last weekend actually while I was out on a walk with my daughter. I decided just to again to take one lens out and it's kind of just using things like this just to walk out with your family to to just keep your photography skills going. It's it's surprising how quickly you can kind of lose lose your way if you stop shooting for a while. So it's important just to keep shooting all the time. And I literally we just kind of took these images as we walked along and I had the thirty five mil on the X T one which is a fifty mil equivalent and I just sort of looked for things that were happening as we went. And just for a bit of fun I also decided I'd only shoot at f1.4 just to give myself a challenge, try and focus on a, on a three year old that's moving which isn't always easy especially with a, a non-DSLR camera. 
and it's a, you know it's just a, a record of my time out with her as well. You could this wasn't done for anything in particular, but you could almost imagine that this could be used in the context of a portfolio showing this is how I would shoot children's fashion wear if I was ever asked to, so you never know when things like this might come in handy. My love of detail again coming out there. And uh, I'll leave you with her smiling face and then hand back over to Jay for any questions. Oh, brilliant, Matthew. Thank you so much. Um, already loads of uh, uh, thank you for the feedback so far. So um, I do have uh, some questions. Um, Matthew, we've already discussed that. We didn't think we'd hit the time limit anyway. So you're okay to stay with us for a little bit, mate? Yep. Brilliant. Um, I'll touch on um, a few questions that have come through now that you've been talking about. Um, so obviously your personal work, but how some of it's been, uh, you know, put, picked up and bought. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier that you um, you have images. Uh, do, can you just remind me of the agencies that you use? Um, I use Alamy and Getty. And again, uh, is it hard now to submit? I know that you can pretty much find this information from their websites, but it's not as hard as it used to be to submit images, is it? It's not as hard as it used to be. One thing that's important when you're submitting to places like that is to make sure you you keyword and get good good descriptions on, so that people can find your work. And uh, you mentioned earlier, and I think this was the case, and I think they just missed what you were talking about. the The image that you took uh, that got used uh, for the campaign for for the Lamb Company, that was mm. something that, that somebody said. How was that image picked up? Was it through the likes of uh, these these sites? Was it? Um, no, um, for, from what I can gather, that was actually I posted that on 500 pics, and I I believe that's where they found that image. Ah, so you don't necessarily have to put things on you know stock image sites to to get noticed. Brilliant, that's great to know. And well, actually, their question was um, was it do you use the likes of Flickr and so on? So yes, you do use 500 pics. Very much so. Yeah. 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 I use Flickr as well, and obviously Facebook and Google Plus is quite a popular one for photographers now. This is quite a relevant question then I think somebody came through they're not asking you know is it something that you know stock photography is there still money to be made or do you feel that eventually now it is sort of dying its death? Um, I, I think it's changing I think if you've got 10,000 20,000 images you know of an apple or two apples you'll, you'll make money out of it um, I find I've tried doing some things like that and just got bored. To be honest, I find the ones that that sell for me are the are the more artistic ones, which kind of surprised me because I wouldn't have thought people were looking on stock photography websites for that sort of thing. But they obviously are, and the licensing terms on those tend to be far more generous than you know something fairly simple, which may be just used on a website once. Uh, brilliant. Um, well, that's my questions on stock photography. Now, I've got quite a few that have um, I've been stockpiling with regards to uh, to the to the Fuji. You, you changed the Fuji. Um, again, they're not in any particular order. Are you missing anything? I know what your answer is going to be, but are you missing anything <laughs> from your old DSLR kit? Um, <clears throat> we might try to say if I said yes, actually. <laughs> And until recently, Fuji never had a wide-angle option, but that's now been filled, and I think with them filling out the range, lens range, I'm not really missing anything in terms of that. The only thing that perhaps is still missing, and I think this is, is industry-wide across mirrorless, is um, a really good TTR flash system, especially off-camera flash system. Well, that actually leads me to my next question. What is your preferred choice of off-camera flash? I know we spoke about this prior to the webinar. But you're, a, you're a speedlight man, uh, but you, you did mention uh, that you just tr you've got something new, you said. Yeah, I, well, I because the, the Fuji system doesn't use TTL, I use a couple of the cheap young Nuo flashes, and they've been absolutely fantastic. In fact, I actually tested them out against my old SB900, and they were more powerful, believe it or not. Um, but what I've just, I had a set of Elinchrome Quadras, and I, I really like those, and the modifiers for those are, are great, but I found the wires and the battery pack were all a bit of a pain, and so I've now sold my soul and bought a 
Profoto B1. The, the only problem with that is perhaps the cost of the modifiers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, going back then to the speed light question for people starting out, how many speed lights do you normally travel with in your, in your kit? It depends on the job really. Um, I usually take one main light, which could be the Profoto or a speed light, but I always, always carry a backup just in case that one dies. Um, but I'll, I'll usually shoot with one, sometimes two lights, but I, I'm not somebody who sets up ten lights to, to light something. It's just not my style. Uh, brilliant, mate. Um, radio triggers. Do you have a preferred set of radio triggers specifically for the Fuji cameras? Uh, yeah, I use the SMDV FlashWave, which I believe are now distributed by Lasterlight, and yes. they have a really small radio trigger which fits perfectly with the uh, with the Fuji system because it doesn't kind of overpower it on the top there, and uh, I found those to work fantastic. They either they'll work up to they'll sync up to a thousandth of a second with the with the X100, no problem as well. Brilliant. Uh, going away from the cameras a bit because I missed this one earlier. Do you have a preferred time of day to shoot? Uh, not necessarily a preferred time of day, but I am a morning person, so I'm quite often awake at half past five, six o'clock, and it's quiet and calm, and I can run out the house without getting told off. <laughs> I'm spending too much time taking photographs. <laughs> so I shoot a lot in the morning, but it's not necessarily... Uh, preference as it were, it's more when I can fit it in to do personal stuff. Again, I think you've answered this question, but it did come through a few times during tonight's webinar, especially when we start talking when we started talking about the Fuji systems. Um, I know your answer because you've answered it, but you feel strongly about this, don't you, that the Fuji cameras can hold up to the professional job? Very much so, yeah. I think, as I said, when I started out, I kind of had the idea that you had to have the top level equipment, but the more I get into it, the more I realize it's it's much more about the image than the technical side of it, and 16 megapixels, even 12 megapixels is, is more than enough for the vast majority of clients. So yeah, very much so, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't just switch to the Fuji just, you know, just for the hell of it, it's, it's, it's because it, it does what I need it to do. Uh, absolutely on that. Uh, leading me on, I know again we've touched on this and it's sort of the same question because the question came through, uh, do you feel that with it not being a full frame that again it, it doesn't hold up but I, I know that we're in agreement with you, it, 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 it can do the job isn't it? Yeah, very much so, very much so. I know this is a huge debate on the APS-C and the full frame thing and I've had full frame cameras, I had a D800 and the difference between the two is not enormous. I mean the 36 megapixels is crazy and you can get some detail, fantastic detail on that, but the, the kind of quality of the images isn't hugely different. The only, I mean if I went to medium format then then I would see the difference. There is a big jump there and that is probably the only other system that I would buy. I would, I would not now even consider going full frame if I wanted better quality, I would go to medium format. Brilliant. We, um, uh, like yourself, and you mentioned there earlier, obviously we have a, a great relationship with Fuji ourselves, and, and all of our Fuji kit that we've uh, we've adopted, like yourself, we've bought. We, again, you know, they, they, they're kind enough to lend us stuff to test. But Mark uh, fell in love here with the, with the X-Pro1, and that's his personal choice of camera for his personal photography now. I've played with it. I think it's fantastic. And much like you, I didn't want to be uh, carrying... Uh, the big bag of, of kit around and, and again like you also love to travel and that was a key thing for me so that's one of the things that I, I fell in love with it over. We had an interesting question that, that we talked, chatted about earlier that I wanted to, to bring up. Um, again it's specifically about lens choice and I remember I think you remember me asking you about somebody who was using the 55-200 to 200, but struggling with uh, with action shots but it, it is practice isn't it Matthew because it's slightly different to, to the old tried methods isn't it? Yeah it is. It's, it is definitely a, a different way of using it and and you have to you do have to spend time getting used to that I mean it, it does depend what body the person is using it with I mean the the difference between the X-Pro1 and now the latest X-T1 is, is quite huge so if they tried perhaps one of the later bodies they would notice quite a big difference but as I said those 
those sailing shots were shot with a, an X Pro One and a 55 to 200, and I can't say that I can't think of anything that I particularly missed. I can't. I mean, I'm not pretending it's the most perfect system in the world here, <laughs> but you just you just learn to work with what you have, and and practice does help. So just get Absolutely. out there and practice. Brilliant, mate. I've just got a couple left. Uh, these are just sort of general questions now. One somebody's asked. I know you've met Susan a few times. Uh, where's your inspiration come from? Obviously, a love of photography, but uh, and I guess from from what's around you and what you see. But maybe you can expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, a lot of a lot of what's around me. Um, I mean, I I look at a lot of images online and I try and get inspiration from those as well. I try not to to copy things because I don't see the point of trying just copying somebody else's work. But you know, I do look at a lot of other people's work as well and think I like that. I'll just try and adapt that a bit or or something like that. I mean, I got into photography because I would I would love to draw and paint, and I just I can't do that. So <laughs> it's kind of my my artistic release. I am. I would say I'm probably more of a technical photographer than a than an artistic photographer, but it's something I'm working on a lot. And uh, it's it's things like um, like I said, picking a subject like like the arches and just looking for that, and it really helps your eye, and you eventually just kind of pick these things out naturally. And it just you know again, it's just just down to practice and getting out and shooting. Well, I think I'd be the first to tell you, even though I can see the technical side in you from tonight's webinar, but I can also see the artist and the creative side of you there, mate. So I wouldn't do yourself any uh, dis dishonor there because it's definitely shown in the images. Um, going to uh, a question then about your series about mono, um, do you shoot with a mono setting on the camera or are you seeing that in post? Um, or would you shoot? I shoot. If, if I know I'm going out to shoot mono, I'll put the camera into the into the mono film simulation mode and funnily enough I'm actually starting to find that it, I'm finding it easier to look at things and compose in mono on the camera so I'll perhaps even if I know I'm shooting color I'm now starting to to shoot in, in the mono simulation mode on the camera and then use the raw files as the color afterwards it's it's a bit of an odd thing and I didn't quite expect that but somehow the mono focuses you on on certain things that you wouldn't necessarily notice in color uh, and again that's how we we do it here to be honest uh, we, we we that's how we work if we're going out there to shoot mono so i don't think it's unusual i think it's just a choice but uh mm. that's what i thought you did but brilliant um matthew quickly just uh sort of uh remind people again um which cameras you are using i know you said you touched on that you mostly use two speed lights um and the lenses that that you prefer, that you prefer um i have uh an x t one I have an XE2 which is generally used as the backup to the XE1 on, on commercial jobs because it's got the same sensor so if I take images with that they'll, they'll look the same. Um, I use the X100S and again that's got the same sensor in so I use that sometimes as a, a second or even third camera on a, on a commercial job. Um, and I have an X-Pro1 which is probably my favourite camera out there personally. But it's, it's you know, if you're shooting commercially, you want the one that you know you stand the best chance of of getting that shot with. And I have to say, even though I prefer the X Pro personally, the XT One is the one I pick up when I'm shooting commercially. Uh, in terms of lenses, I have um, quite a restricted range. Actually, I have the 14 mil, 35 mil, 50 mil Tuit lens. Um, obviously, the X100S has got a 23, which is a 35 mil on it. And I have the kit, for want of a better word, 18 to 55 mil zoom lens. So that, that's it. And do you have a favourite lens? Uh, lens, no. Camera, yes. If if you're talking about lenses, I would pick up the X100S because I love the look that comes out of the lens, that lens. But I can't say that it's a lens because it's attached to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favourite lens, but it's not a lens on its own. Fair enough. And is that your favourite camera? Um, X Pro One, I think. X Pro One, yeah, mm. brilliant. Um, final question. Um, we obviously touched that you do most of your work in Lightroom. Do you use any other software at all? I have tried some of the other software out there. Um, 
and I know there's a bit of a debate about whether Lightroom renders the, the Fuji RAW files particularly well or not. Uh, it's not really an issue that's bothered me. Um, I tried Capture One, and that if people are worried about that, that does seem to work a bit better with the, the Fuji RAW files, especially for foliage and things. Um, but I just find Lightroom all around the quickest and the easiest. You can catalog easily, keep a track of all your files, and you know it does the job for me. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, had some fantastic feedback. Love, love tonight. Thank you for thanking you for your time, as I will do shortly. Let's just remind people on how they can find out a little bit more about you, Matthew. Obviously, the, your website is um, it's memaddock.co.uk, isn't it? So it's uh, just to, I got that right, haven't I? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And obviously, the the Fuji blog site is photomad with the double d dot com. Double D, like my surname, yes. Excellent. Um, and that's where you can find out and obviously get in touch with Matthew and keep up to date with everything that he's got going on. And the best way to find out whatever we've got going on, like tonight's webinar that we've done uh, with Matthew and all of our future webinars and anything we've got going on with the Photography Academy is via our Facebook page, and that's facebook.com forward slash the Photography Academy. Matthew, thank you so much for tonight. There has been loads in the chat panel there thanking you for your time, finding it very inspirational and also informative. So from me, thank you for joining us, um, no and uh, hopefully, possibly, you'll, like I said, we we'll do some more for us in the future as well as possibly some film. That'd be brilliant. Yep, sounds good. Excellent. Enjoy that. Brilliant. Right, guys, that's it. Uh, we're done. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jay for the Photography Academy. Thank you again to Matthew Maddock, and we'll see you all again real soon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>